During this month of May, we commemorate those men and women who have served our country. I've met and talked to a lot of people, but one in particular interest to me is a man by the name of Peter Holden. And Peter and his brother have served the Milford community for many, many years with their store called Holden's, which, by the way, has some of the best fried chicken I have ever had. In talking to Peter, I soon discovered that he was a serviceman in the 60s, deployed as a helicopter pilot in Vietnam. There's been a lot of politics about our involvement in that war, but from my vantage point, there's no greater honor than to stand aside your fellow men and women when the call is received. Peter, I really appreciate your coming to speak with us today, and also I want to thank you for your service. Let me start this conversation by asking you what sparked your interest in aviation. Growing up in Milford, I had a, a friend, um, uh, Bill Ash, and Bill and I made model airplanes together as kids, mm. and that's the one you use with a um, handheld uh, controller that you would either go up or Going down around in a circle. In a circle. And so we built those, and then we built some gliders, and uh, we'd let them get up, and then you'd have to follow them to where they would finally glide and come to the ground. And do that so uh, it started early um, and then the young man that I was commuting with to school decided that he had a draft notice too at the same time and so we both decided that um, uh, rather to go in as um, US you had if you went in US you were drafted for two years if you join you could go in as regular army for three once we got into the service and we got down to Fort Knox, that's where they start. The Army will then start testing you to see what your abilities are and what uh, they feel that they need from you as a person, where you could be best suited in what they have to offer. And so I was offered two schools, either communication school or flight school. Flight school was the first one I was offered. and. Uh, by the time they had offered me the communication school, I already decided I wanted to do flight school. That really piqued my interest in. You know, I wanted to learn to fly, and I just, even knowing where I was going, I just couldn't resist the offer. When I when I got to Vietnam. There was a Chinook outfit, since that's the aircraft that I was trained in. Can you explain Vietnam. Chinook, what that means to our public? Uh, the Chinook is a CH-47. It's a Boeing Virtual Helicopter. It's heavy lift. Um, the body is 55 feet long from rotor tip to rotor tip is 99 feet on its length. So there's two rotors? Correct. It has two turbine engines. The ones at the time I flew them were 3,000. 750 shaft horsepower each, so combine the horsepower 7,500 horsepower for the Chinook. The Chinook was a heavy lift. Primary duty for the Chinook was uh, resupply, mainly for the re relocation of artillery positions, 105 and 15 howitzer positions, the resupply of those positions, bringing in water to remote areas. Uh, they had water tanks that uh, jeeps could hook up to on a trailer, tanks on a trailer that you could move. Any heavy equipment that had to go in, generators and things like that. The uh, Hueys, which were smaller, was the primary helicopters for the uh, insertion extraction of uh, the military personnel into LZs within. LZ is a landing zone um, in Vietnam. Uh, they did not use Chinooks primarily for doing that. Sometimes they did if they had a big move, but generally it was the Hueys that did that. The Chinooks that I flew were primarily support uh, for taking in equipment and supplies to the bases that were there. Sometimes they were remote, which uh, um, you had to, those are the ones that you would receive enemy fire for the most. Um, most of the base camps you did not, they were secure, you did not receive fire from them. But, but you were the pilot. Correct. Did you have anybody else on board with you who was... The, the, the Chinook has a crew of five. There's the uh, command pilot, the co-pilot, 
there's the flight engineer who's in charge in the back. He looks to make sure everything's operating correctly. There's a crew chief who's also responsible for the maintenance of the aircraft and a gunner. Behind the cockpit, there's two windows on either side, on the right and left, and we had M60s machine guns in both those windows. So if we were going in and needed to return fire, they, the two gunners would be able to do that. You have shown me stills, some photographs of uh, bullet holes, incoming fire. Correct. How often would that have happened? Uh, was that a regular thing, or was that like uh, not very frequently? Probably once a week. Really? Yes. I'm, that had to be nerve-wracking. I well, that would be the. Well, you. I, I, I don't know. I don't know how <laughs> I would settle with any of that. But go ahead. And talk. Well, you. What you're, were you feeling that, about this? Well, at 22, you're really you're concentrating on getting the mission done, and. Um, so sometimes you receive the fire and you don't know where it's come from. But they have, you're such a large aircraft, they have to be precise on where they're going to hit the aircraft to take it down. There are times we'd go in, we never even felt the round come in. And but you it, wouldn't hear it? You, you wouldn't hear it. hear it, no. We went in to resupply a forward artillery position that was known hostile. This one was so hostile that you required to have gunship support to go in. Gunships there to suppress enemy fire. Short final, I heard the automatic weapon open up. We took 37 rounds wow. in that one burst. It does disable it enough that we couldn't continue with that aircraft. We were very fortunate that uh, nobody was injured or killed in that one. We took 37 rounds and they were, they were all around us. They were around me in the cockpit and the behind on the gunner behind me and then down the back of the aircraft. Was the gunner it, was the gunner firing back? Or, no, we or never you, fired. You, you we did, did not. We did. We. You didn't know where it was but, coming from. Well, the rules of engagement. We couldn't fire into. There was a town that was just to the side of that camp that we, with the, the artillery position was located, and so the enemy, much like they do um, over in uh, the Mid East over here for for Iraq and other words, they'll fire from a town where you can't go fire back into because of the rules of engagement. Unless I can identify the person firing, we couldn't fire back. Because of civilian? Because of civilian casualties, yes. Yeah. It's just, I mean, it would seem so difficult to make those distinctions while you're in that uh, tension and anxiety. Hey, well, we, we got out of there pretty quick. We just could continue. We didn't continue the landing into the, the LZ. We made a couple of turns and got back to altitude and went and dropped the load off. In January of 69, it could have been a little bit earlier, the VC had been testing the perimeter of our southeast um, facility, our, our, our uh, airfield. Mm -hmm where we had guard shacks and we're watching patrol, they were able to get close enough to lob grenades or satchels of explosives into the guard shacks, kill the people, penetrate in, and destroy a number of our aircraft. It could happen at any time that they could come in on your base. And that's why guerrilla war is so hard and so many young men didn't know what to do there. There could be a child that would have a grenade on you or a woman that would have a, a machine gun hiding in their clothing that you would not even detect or a bomb or something there. That was the case. There was no uniform. If they put 40 people in front of you, they all dressed the same, you would know who the Viet Cong was. They all looked the same. They learned not to do something that was obvious, but they would, they would in their working would be able to do something in there to get to let them know the VC know where to mortar. You would look at the people, they were friendly when you were there during the day, but at night you didn't you couldn't tell. Did you ever have any concern having served there for that time that you would not make it home? Was there any of that thought at, with you or no? I guess I did not let that consume me. I for whatever 
I was able to concentrate on each day. So I didn't look past that particular day. This is what I had to do to get by today. I get it done. From the, the first day I got there to the day before I left, that's what I concentrated on was, what did I have to do to survive today? Can you tell me your impression of the uh, Vietnamese people in general? Is there something, anything that particularly struck you? It was a, considered a third world country. Of course, the dress is totally different. The religion is different for the most part. If I was to look at it, you know, people are people. It doesn't matter where they're at. Um, they, they, they're going to have a family. They're going to meet somebody within their culture that they've fallen mm -hmm. in love with or their mate that they have. They have children. I say they're not much different from us. It's just it's a different culture, different things that were there. What would you say in all of this was your most valuable experience of all your enlisting uh, for those four years? Well, I know the service, in much like in any good sports team, the first thing is teamwork. They really instill teamwork. You're going to be part of a group, and you have responsibilities, and your responsibilities are important within the team, and you have to live up to those responsibilities. If everybody lives up to their potential and doing what they have to do, it's a better chance for you to survive and get home. There is camaraderie with that, but there's a real respect that you have for the guys, and especially when you're in a combat situation and stuff, at the time you're there, you don't appreciate just how much they actually do. You're concentrating on what you need to do to get through, and not so much on what they're doing, but when you sit back now and you look at it, you realize how great a job everybody did to get you through something that could have taken your life. You were there for one another. Yeah. Every day, you get in and you do your job. Peter, thank you so much for joining us. It's been such a pleasure and so informative. As we approach this Memorial Day, I want to thank you for the service that you've rendered back in the 60s. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Hey, you're welcome.